time, so let's get started. Hi, I'm Bonnie Weddle from the New York State Archives, and on behalf of the Siri Education and Programming Subcommittee, I want to welcome you all to Mutual Assured Protection, Records Management's role in litigation holds. If you haven't already done so, please use the chat feature to let us know where you, who you are and where you work or attend school. If you have colleagues or friends physically in the room with you, also let us know how many people uh, are with you. Slide, please. Okay, before we get started, I want to take just a couple of minutes to alert you to some upcoming events. We ordinarily take this time to publicize upcoming Siri webinars, but for reasons that will become apparent in just a couple of minutes, uh, we don't have any webinars scheduled for May or June. The Siri webinar series usually takes a summer break, but we are exploring the possibility of organizing a July or August webinar this year, so keep your eye on the COSA newsletter and COSA's social media accounts. And if we don't organize a summer webinar, we will see you all in September. If the thought of not attending any Siri webinars uh, over the next couple of months leaves you crestfallen, please be assured that lots of other things are going on. First off, please note that the National Digital Stewardship Alliance is hosting DigiPres 23, its annual meeting in St. Louis, Missouri in November. If you're interested in presenting, please note that the call for papers closes at 11.59 p.m. on May 1st. Please note that financial support may be available um, to at least some presenters and attendees. For more information, go to ndsa.org. And on May 18th, COSA is sponsoring a half-day virtual discussion-oriented unconference, the State Electronic Records Initiative, State and Territory Excellence in Electronic Records Unconference. Series Steer, as it's called, will feature tracks focusing on records management, appraisal and description, digitization and access, as well as a capstone discussion on the challenges of email and COSA's PREPARE grant, which focuses on email management. This event is free of charge. We're really excited about it. And links uh, that will enable you to attend are on COSA's website, www.statearchivists.org. It's also the main reason we're not having a Siri webinar in May. In June, a couple of things are going on uh, that are of interest to the COSA community. Unfortunately, they're happen happening at the same time. The Best Practices Exchange will be held in person at the University of Georgia starting on June 12th. It's my understanding that registration for the BPE is closed, but if you are going, you will find lots and lots of other COSA folks there. If you can't make it to the BPE this year, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is Champaign is sponsoring a free virtual three-day email archiving symposium that starts on June 13th. Registration for the symposium was still open as of this morning, and Googling UIUC email archiving symposium will take you right to its website. If you attend the symposium, you'll find lots of other COSA folks there, myself included. Um, finally, a quick reminder about COSA's online resources, including recordings of past Siri webinars and the COSA Research Center, which provides access to state government guidance documents and a wealth of information about electronic records management and digital preservation tools and workflows. Uh, slide, please. And now just a word about our sponsors, the work of the State Electronic Records Initiative and COSA more generally are, is made possible through the generous support of Ancestry.com, the Northeast Document Conservation Center, AVP, Family Search, Apex Software, and Atlas Systems, and we thank all of them for their support. Slide, please. And let's get down to the business at hand. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, today's presenters. Perry Swift is the university, the university records manager for The Ohio State University. Prior to joining OSU, she served for eight years as senior records manager at the Ohio Attorney General's office, building its records man program from the ground up and partnering with IT and legal staff on multiple major initiatives. She began her records career at the Ohio State at the Ohio Historical Society State Archives Branch, where she spent nine years as local government records archivist and then assistant state archivist. Perry has served as chair of the Ohio Electronic Records Committee and of the governor-appointed Ohio Rest Historical Records Advisory Board, was president of the National Association of Government Archives and Records Administrators, NAGARA, and of the Greater Columbus Chapter of ARMA. She currently serves as NAGARA's treasurer, volunteers on NAGARA's Professional Development Committee after serving for five years as its chair, and is the Education and Seminar Director for ARMA Greater Columbus. She received her BA from Wittenberg University and her MLIS degree from the University of Pittsburgh. In 2014, 
she became a certified records manager. In her quote unquote free time, Perry leads her daughter's Girl Scout troop as a council delegate and a member of her local Girl Scout service unit team. Nathan Owens is the records manager for the Ohio Attorney General's office, where he's responsible for developing retention schedules, assisting with records related issues throughout the office, and managing the office's document and records management system. Nate is also a member of the Ohio Electronic Records Committee, where he works on the development of standards and guidelines for electronic records for public entities in the state of Ohio. He received an MA in public history from the Indiana University of Pennsylvania, an MLIS from the University of Pittsburgh, and is an information uh, governance professional, uh, holds that certificate from ARMA International. And with that, I am going to turn the floor over to Perry and Nathan. You're muted, Perry. Well, thank you for that introduction and uh, and for having us here today. We look forward to uh, giving this presentation. So Nate and I are, are tag teaming this whole presentation, um, but I am gonna turn my camera off to make sure that I save bandwidth uh, during the session. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. If they immediately relate to uh, the slide that we're on, we'll cover them. If we know we're covering them later, um, we may wait until um, the end uh, to take most questions. All right, so records managers play a crucial role in the e-discovery and litigation hold process. And I'm sure that you're probably thinking, well, I'd rather stay as far away from litigation as possible. But I think that by the end of this presentation, you're gonna realize just how valuable records professionals can be during this process. Discovery and e-discovery is the pretrial practice of obtaining facts and information about a case to assist the party's preparation for trial. Parties have to disclose categories of documents and data compilations that are relevant to the litigation. So what you see on the screen here is the electronic discovery reference model. And you'll see on the left that it starts with a really large volume of records and information. And then as we move to the right on the model, the volume gets smaller. Well, our ro role as records professionals is primarily the first two on the left. And you'll see that the very, very first step in this legal concept of the electronic records or the electronic discovery reference model is us. You'll see here that this is the information governance reference model. And in the middle, it's kind of tiny, but in there, you're going to see the records life cycle. We're first in this concept, in this model for electronic discovery. You're going to hear us talk a lot about ESI. And if you're involved in any part of litigation, you'll hear a lot of conversation about ESI. So what in the world is ESI? Well, the better question is, what isn't ESI? So ESI is electronically stored information and it's structured data, it's unstructured data. Now I know that just about everybody on this webinar has retention schedules, probably for all their structured data, and you probably implement regular disposition. But what's being done with all the unstructured data? Because unlike paper, electronically stored information is more easily lost. It's more easily modified or overwritten or deleted unless we take active steps throughout the records life cycle and information life cycle to manage the process. And we need to take these steps throughout the life of the litigation as well. So keep in mind that federal and state rules of discovery are very different from FOIA or from public records requests. ESI can be official records. They can be, it can be transient records or ESI can be non-records. They can be personal records. It can just be data or information. Your organization has a duty to preserve um, when litigation seems imminent. At this stage, each side has not yet met to discuss the scope of the discovery request. So the dirty duty to preserve should be relatively broad and it should encompass 
what's known or reasonably should be known, what's relevant to the litigation, what's reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence, what's reasonably likely to be requested in discovery, and what actually is the subject of a pending discovery request. Your litigation hold is gonna begin when a lawsuit can be reasonably anticipated. This does not mean that we've been served yet. It just means litigation is reasonably anticipated on a particular topic. And at this stage, we need to notify potential custodians. We need to notify our records and information management team, our IT team and legal. So, we want to make sure that we're safeguarding the relevant and potentially relevant discoverable information, both record and non-record, that we have under our control. This notification should be in writing, and we don't want to send it just once. We want to send regular reminders, and Nate's going to talk about that when he talks about the process that the Attorney General's Office put in place in Ohio. We want to document all the steps that are taken so that we have an audit trail of our litigation hold process. Because opposing counsel is gonna scrutinize your process. A litigation hold requires that the preservation of all evidence that's relevant and accessible. And sometimes it, it means, it, or it's gonna mean halting deletion, destruction, and the overwriting of ESI identified in the litigation hold notice. And that's really key is Sometimes just overriding is gonna destroy evidence. And how many systems do we have where somebody just changes the date, the date of last contact, or just changes some information? So electronically stored information makes this process of preservation more difficult. And so we need to continually uh, monitor these things. Uh, even just simply opening a document can alter the metadata of that document. And printing it, isn't sufficient because metadata is gonna be lost. A lot of times we need it in that native format. We wanna take immediate and affirmative steps to preserve data from routine and automatic deletion, altering our normal document retention destruction process, and sometimes altering our backup practices as well. And finally, we need to remember to suspend hard drive scrubbing. When those employees separate, practice might be come in, take that hard drive, scrub it, and get it ready for the next person. But if there are records kept on the hard drive, and if you think that people aren't keeping records on their hard drive because you're telling them not to, you're wrong. They're probably keeping them on their hard drive, and we probably need to preserve those. When a litigation hold is issued, the following steps should occur, and I'm just gonna breeze through these steps uh, so you know what they are. The attorney is gonna identify custodians, document types, document content, date ranges of the requested electronically stored information. They should work with the records manager to identify the retention and disposition schedules of the applicable types of documents. These things are gonna be important. They should take uh, steps to pull or take snapshots of the hard drives of any custodians, establish collection preservation and storage protocol, identify sources of data that may not be readily accessible, establish an ESI processing and production game plan, and maintain a defensible audit trail for each step in the preservation collection and production process. So, while most of this list appears to be the responsibility of legal or IT, I encourage records managers to be actively involved or at least aware of what's going on at each of these steps. Now, why would I encourage that? Besides the fact that there's a very real chance that you, as the records professional, could have to respond to related uh, interrogatories or even be deposed, on the process, your litigation hold process, your records processes, you might even have to take the witness stand, although I hope you never do. Uh, and then someday all of this information that you've put on hold is going to come off of that hold. And it's going to be the records manager's responsibility to assess whether any records have met their retention period at that point and can be disposed of, or whether they need to be retained longer because retention has not yet expired. And as you can probably tell, 
collection and preservation process can lead to making copies of records. It could lead to records being stored in locations that it might not otherwise be stored in, maybe not the original location. And although IT oversaw the collection of these records and any other electronically stored information, it's the records manager's responsibility to ensure that IT does not implement disposition just because a hold's been lifted. They need to talk to you about which records are eligible. Spoliation. This is a word that's gonna come up and it's the destruction or alteration or mutilation of ESI and paper evidence. Paper records, they stand less of a chance of spoliation because they're more difficult to alter without creating a new version. It's easy for the records manager to catch and halt the disposition of paper on review of a disposal request. Are staff sending disposition forms in when you're reviewing or for you to review before they delete electronic documents? Or what about automated deletions? How are those being documented? With electronic documents, we frequently go in, we change those documents as we continue to work in them. And that's why it's so incredibly important to preserve anything relevant immediately. If there's ongoing, uh, if there's an ongoing need to continue to work in that document, then a duplicate's going to need to be made. Uh, audit trails on how the original was preserved and how copies were made would also may, need to be made uh, and documented. Courts have held litigants accountable for failing to place holds on document destruction routines. Destruction processes are the biggest and the easiest issue for opposing counsel to hone in on. Think about it. If their case isn't strong in the facts of the case, they're going to start looking other places in order to, to nail you a little bit. And they might look toward your retention and destruction practices. So take a look at the results from this uh, 2019 Cohasset ARMA benchmarking survey. And this is particularly the litigation hold or the legal hold uh, sections. And you're going to see that 61% agree that more information than necessary is typically retained due to how legal holds are written and applied. We're over-preserving. 54% agree that upon the conclusion or closure of the litigation, normal retention and disposition processes are effectively reinstated. However, only 44% agree that in their organization, there are automated tools used to locate and preserve relevant information. And 46%, or almost half, use the, um, their disaster recovery backups to satisfy litigation holds. This is not a good practice to have. And I do believe we cover why uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, further looking at the 2019 Cohasset ARMA benchmarking survey, uh, they found that there were opportunities to preserve the whole process, and that includes opportunities to leverage automation to improve and increase confidence in preservation outcomes. They encourage the users of legal holds to collaborate with IT and information experts such as ourselves to define a scope that's reasonable and implementable. Um, there is an opportunity to improve uh, by distinguishing between disaster recovery media and archival media, which is used for retention purposes. We want to apply short retention periods and rotation schedules to disaster recovery media so that it's solely used for the purpose of disaster recovery. And if we can demonstrate that it's solely used for disaster recovery and not used to respond to FOIA or public records or discovery requests, then we're, we're better able to say, you know what, we don't we're not going to look at that um, in, in this discovery request. Uh, we want to assign retention to the archival media based on the business purpose or the use of that information. And then finally, when a hold's lifted, um, we want to effectively end that preservation and resume business as usual retention and disposition practices. So we've started to touch on over-preservation. 
A couple causes for overpreservation is retaining records beyond their retention periods. Another is decentralized filing. If we can't target a particular filing area, we don't know exactly where those types of records are. We have to cast a broader net and we're going to overpreserve. So what are the challenges that come along with overpreservation? Well, it adds to the risk level and the complexity of the litigation. Um, we have this fear that spoliation charges during litigation are, are going to lead uh, to our legal to overpreserve. So we're afraid of spoliation charges. So therefore, we're going to preserve too much. We need to be confident in the practices that we're going to talk about, and then we can alleviate that fear. In routine disposal of anything stops during litigation when it's on hold. But stopping this routine disposal leads to increased storage costs. It leads to increased records that are responsive to FOIA and public records requests. And it leads to increased records that are responsible to other litigation. So we wanna make sure that we are, are narrowing or tightening the records that are part of the hold and that when we're not in litigation, we're implementing our retention and destruction. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nate. Thanks, Barry. So even before we get into that litigation phase where we're worried about identifying, preserving things, there are many preventative measures we as record professionals can take to prepare our organizations or our office for any sort of litigation, anticipated litigation situation uh, beforehand. Uh, next slide, Perry. <laughs> And the best thing to do, you know, that, that saying you always hear, best offense is a good defense. And one of the things to keep in mind is your office's policies and procedures are the best thing to set up a, a strong background for your office's records management program. Um, you know, when we're thinking of that EDRM chart, think of that very first section, the, the information governance uh, model that is what you need to have in place and working at all times. So when we talk about policies and procedures, these need to be in place prior to any sort of litigation situation. So they can't be you know, implemented after the fact. They need to be communicated to all affected employees of your organization. They need to be implemented in a consistent, repeatable manner. And this will lead then to defensibility. It also helps with this meet and confer uh, portion that your attorneys will deal with when it does come time for litigation. So say your office is going to get some sort of anticipated litigation or litigation is coming, your attorneys are then going to reach out and start working with your records team and your IT team to review policies and procedures in hand. And this is really going to help set the tone um, when you then meet with the opposing counsel. Um, and so some examples of policies and procedures, you know, this is very, you know, straightforward, but there are little complexities that we might need to think about. So, you know, obviously we should have a records management policy in place to guide the office on how we're managing our records. We should have record retention schedules in place. We should have some sort of record disposal procedure with a record disposal form or a sign off process. In your HR policies, having some sort of information or procedure in regards to employee separations, you know, like what Perry was saying about uh, someone leaving the office and their, you know, computer may have relevant information for a case, we want to suspend any sort of scrubbing of that equipment. Um, I'm going to have some more information on this later on. Actions against employee misuse of records, that might be another thing your HR policy should have in place, so that way you're covering your office's uh, uh, situation if a, say, disgruntled employee leaves the office and decides to shred a bunch of stuff that is relevant to a case or delete a bunch of things. You know, we want to have something in place that kind of covers our bases on what is misused, what is not. Having a public records, FOIA policy in place is always good. And then having a computer use and technology policies covering things like how electronic records should be stored, where electronic records should be stored, and how electronic records could be transferred or shared. 
you know, laying the foundation, setting the standard of where everything should be. So that way, if there are outliers, that's what they are, outliers. Um, you know, one of the big things that are, you know, an issue is when you have these organizations where everybody kind of has their own filing system or you're allowed to use personal devices or personal accounts to store records, that becomes very unmanageable when it does come time for issuing a litigation hold. Next slide. <clears throat> So one of the things that we need to, you know, with the spoilation and uh, you know, those types of claims that could come against us, we want to try avoiding sanctions as best as possible. And to do this, we need to create safe harbor. So per federal rules of civil procedure 37E, uh, the safe harbor is when ESI is lost or un overwritten and unrecoverable as a result of routine good faith operation of electronic information system. So basically, if you are following your office's record retention schedules, policies, and procedures, and you have destroyed relevant information towards the case that you're involved in, you're, you're at least protected in that thing because you have been doing your routine procedures as normal. And this creates legal defensibility for yourselves. You know, it demonstrates that there was a matter of routine business process followed rather than some more nefarious actions or, you know, every man doing their own thing kind of thing. We're establishing that documented, repeatable process each day in and out kind of thing. Next slide. So, you know, some people may, you might ask yourself, well, how can we avoid sanctions? How can we avoid claims of spoilation? Well, why can't we just keep everything? Well, the problem is you are not following any sort of policy or procedure at that point, and you're losing that safe harbor. And it leads to those issues, like Perry just pointed out a second ago, to overpreservation. You know, one of the things with discovery is it is a burdensome review process. It is not simple. I mean, if you look at how discovery review was done 30 or 40 years ago, it was literally pulling boxes into a empty room, warehouse, whatever you want to say, and having to do review by hand. At least now you have technology that helps you with it. But, you know, considering the size of terabytes and the different number of accounts that have to be reviewed, it becomes complex. And discovery review is costly. It, you go through the process of identifying things, collecting things, continuing that storage of those records, and it becomes very costly over time. It, it's not something that's very manageable or very, you know, very easy to cash out that check on. And like Perry mentioned, you know, if we're keeping everything under the sun, you're possibly going to lead to more being uncovered, more ESI that could be used against your office in that litigation or other litigation that might come against your office. So you need to really look at it, that line of business value over preservation. You know, there are going to be those things that you want to keep longer than the retention schedule says for, but remember, your retention schedules are setting the standard. You don't want to be over preserving everything, only certain things. And so on the flip side, you know, besides keeping everything, we can't randomly pick or choose what we want to keep either. That's not a defensible uh, part of your retention policy. Um, it needs to be your retention policy and your retention schedules are setting the standard. And then anything that is an exception to that, you know, there are going to be exceptions and we have to deal with that. But we want to set the standard for our offices with our retention schedules and policies, and they need to be implemented in under a neutral condition and consistently with good faith. So again, if we're showing this is our routine process, it's going to help ourselves. And by having our record disposal process, monitoring that compliance of we know this record has met retention, it can be destroyed, that is defensible disposition. And having that process of review, filling out a record disposal form, getting approval from it, it protects us. It shows, you know, that receipt of what we had and what we had gotten rid of. Next slide. So something to also keep in mind too, uh, before any sort of litigation happens is, you know, the common employee is not thinking about records management. They're not thinking about record retention schedules on a daily basis. They are worried about their day-to-day -day tasks. 
They are not thinking about where they need to file or how long this thing has to be retained for. They're not going to be thinking about in terms of compliance or security in relation to where they store things, how they're keeping things. And they're not worried about any sort of potential future litigation against the office. And this is where records management needs to step in and assist, whether it is providing tools or training to help classify or make filing of records easier in accordance with records retention schedules. So for instance, in my office, we've had for several years now a document management system. It's organized by case, record series, matter, however you want to describe it. But once you file it into our system, it's organized. It has appropriate retention schedules tied to it. We can apply litigation holds to those records if needed. So it really organizes everything right off the get-go for ourselves. So basically, some files something in there, they don't have to worry about records management ever again because I'm going to be tracking it on the back end. You know, offering quarterly or annual or biannual trainings, you know, reminders about what is their duties when it comes in terms of records management. And then, you know, determining how to improve that discovery response, um, you know, identifying how can we make it easier to identify relevant records for preservation under a litigation fold? How could we reduce our search times? How can we reduce the scope of a hold? How can we lock down things? So, you know, it's nice when you have a document management system, but let's say you're dealing with a shared drive. You know, shared drives are unstructured environments. So you need to guide the office in how we should be organizing and maintaining shared drives so it does reduce that search time, makes things much more organized to find. So, you know, having a filing structure, having naming conventions, something like that to make it easier to identify and find things. Next slide. So, we have all that from the pre-litigation standpoint, but let's say we do enter into some sort of litigation situation. Next slide. You know, records management's biggest role is really all that pre-litigation stuff and throughout the development and implementation of policy. But records management also plays a huge role in that uh, early stages of discovery. So if we're looking at the EDRM model here, we are talking about the identification phase, that first, uh, block after the information governance reference model. And so if we have done our pre-litigation job well in advance, we have developed things like a file plan data map, and we have organized our records in a standard uniform manner, such as by record series, function, instead of allowing our office to just organize or have an every man for himself kind of filing scheme. And this is going to make it much easier for legal to identify potentially relevant records and custodians for IT to work with to preserve those records. Next slide. So, and, and so, you know, when I talk about a data map, a data map is basically a listing of an organization's ESI by category or record series, location, custodian, steward, how it's being stored, how it's accessed associated retention policies and procedures to it. And this is something where you really need to work hand in hand with your IT because they're gonna understand what systems exist in your office. And they're gonna understand what kind of policies are tied to these systems right now. Um, you know, one of the things that a lot in the records management profession are dealing with now is Office 365. You know, Office 365 has all sorts of things tied to it now, and it's stored in different manners and has different policies assigned to it. So, you know, this is really important where understanding how and where electronic records are stored is crucial. You know, understanding how there's accounts. Is there automated policies on those accounts? You know, does my email delete after 30 days? Does a uh, user's OneDrive disappear after 30 days when they separate the, from the office? Is there access permissions or limitations? So, you know, these are all types of things that are going to affect how someone can find these records when we need to start identifying them for litigation purposes. Next. So working with your IT to figure out that data map, but then we also then have to work with our legal counsel. You know, before that meet and confer, so per uh, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 26F, where your legal counsel is meeting with the opposing side, you need to work with your legal counsel to figure certain things. Where is that relevant ESI being stored? What 
are the physical and technological limitations of your IT. So, you know, what are they able to pull up? What are they able to report on? What are they able to preserve, let's say? For RIM, what data has been destroyed either by scheduled disposition or by mistake? You know, there are gonna be exceptions and there's gonna be mistakes when it comes to record destruction. If we fess up about it up front and be uh, uh, honest up front, we may not be punished that much when it comes to you know the courts. You know we may not get sanctions against us if we're upfront about it. You know, look, we had a server crash on us. Everything got lost. We couldn't back it up. It happened. You know, kind of thing. Retention schedules. You know, having those in place to assist in identifying potentially relevant information in your office. Inaccessible information. So, you know, this cannot be overused. Courts will not buy a claim that ESI is inaccessible simply just because you say it is. You need to show proof of why information is inaccessible, such as the time it would take, the cost, the effort, the burden to get it and produce it. This is going to require an expert's affidavit in detail to explain why hundreds of backup tapes containing terabytes of data cannot be just reasonably recovered or produced. And the attorney, you know, isn't going to be an expert on that. So they're going to need your help, IT's help to kind of explain that. Then, you know, the next two pieces, where is the chain of custody for relevant ESI and where's the audit trail? You know, this is where that metadata, like Perry kind of mentioned at the beginning here, where, you know, having all that metadata tied to your records being preserved upfront for, you know, preservation is crucial. You know, when was this file created? You know, it hasn't been modified since its creation. Um, it hasn't been moved, hasn't been touched, hasn't been deleted, you know, that type of thing. Okay, now I think I throw it back to you, Perry. All right, thanks, Nate. During the pretrial process, the record staff and IT staff may be asked to provide information um, to your attorneys, maybe even to the opposing counsel. Uh, and this could be via written interrogatories or sworn affidavits or even uh, deposition by opposing counsel uh, on your records processes. And those records processes could be what your policies and procedures are. They may want to see them. Um, they might want to see your retention schedules or ask questions about your schedules or your disposition practices. Um, your email policy and procedures maybe what you did to locate, preserve, and protect the relevant information, who you talked to and when, and how you documented that process. Um, I thankfully have never been deposed, but I was in the prep stages of being deposed at one time. Um, what actually made them made opposing counsel decide that they didn't want to depose me was uh, we presented this stuff and they looked it over and uh, decided that there really wasn't much that they were going to get out of me um, that would help them in any way. So I was really grateful to have all of these things in place, uh, but I was being prepared to answer questions about them. Keep in mind that there's going to be a different attorney uh, potentially leading each case and therefore each discovery issue. So um, our repeatable processes or consistency is incredibly important. Uh, this includes your organization's policy and processes, but it also means um, consistency with your early access uh, team, your early case assessment team. And they should be uh, include a lead attorney, dedicated IT staff person, the records manager, and litigation support. And um, this should include discussion on communications with the attorneys. These should all be repeatable processes. Notification, same notification process each time. Same way of tracking compliance with the litigation hold. And repeatable processes in gathering, reviewing, and producing information. Having a case assessment team and litigation support allows the attorney to focus on reviewing the documents and making the case. Yeah, so kind of building off of what Perry just said there is, you know, this is where it becomes really crucial, that initial messaging of a litigation hold. Um, you know, having a consistent process, again, builds that defensibility for yourself. So, you know, when we 
are trying to coordinate with record custodians to have records in their control, you know, pause those record destruction processes or have IT automated processes paused or stopped. It needs to be consistently done each time. And this is where, you know, the information Perry just said, the, the results of that Cohasset ARMA benchmarking survey, it really shows that there are a number of improvements one could or one needs to do for the legal hold processes. So, you know, for example, at the Ohio Attorney General's office, we had several issues with our legal hold process in that we wanted to correct through a new uniform process. Um, you know, some of these issues were we would issue litigation hold memos that were very broad or very vague in scope and contain too many custodians. You know, it could be for an entire department. Well, you know, not everyone in that department is going to be relevant to this case we might be dealing with. Weak communications between uh, the groups that are issuing it. You know, we, when it came to coordinating between RIM, IT, litigation support, we often found that, you know, of the three groups, you know, one would get certain information, the other one wouldn't hear about it, or one would start preserving stuff, but the others didn't know that was happening at the time. Over preserving, you know, maintaining uh, more records than were needed. So, you know, sometimes it was we were preserving an entire Outlook account rather than figuring out, okay, is there actual emails in this account that we need for the case? You know, maybe it's only 10 emails, so we don't need to keep this entire account. Or when someone separates the office, you know, that hard drive we're taking out of their computer, does it truly have stuff for the case or is there nothing on it? And this was just, you know, just because that person was a custodian, they didn't actually keep something on there. And then lastly, and this is just pretty much typical for any sort of litigation hold, not being communicated when to release those lit holds. You know, all, all lit holds are really dependent on that managing attorney of that case to notify RIM, IT, lit support that the case is done. And, you know, we need a process in place to make that a routine review to do this. Next slide. So, um, about a year or two ago, I was tasked with building a tracking system uh, in our SharePoint environment to track and manage our issued litigation holds for our office. And this is again, to increase that defensibility in how we do things. And some of the high level things we wanted to achieve here was centralized issuing and tracking of internal litigation holds for our office through a request form process. Uh, and this was uh, the desire of this form was to identify more information upfront about that lit hold and get it on record. Uh, so we didn't have this vague message going out. Secondly, we wanted to collect and document the acknowledgements from record custodians that they understand that they are on lit hold now. They need to preserve records that are relevant to litigation, avoid any sort of records retention destruction procedures, and then build in an automated notice and reminder system. So that way we can remind people after six months, three months, whatever, you're on lit hold or messaging to the managing attorney of that case. Hey, there's a lit hold out there in your name. Is this still necessary or not? We also have in this SharePoint site a way to track records, accounts, other media that is being preserved for litigation purposes. So it's almost like an inventory of the stuff that we are going to preserve. So we're almost stepping into that next phase on the EDRM chart of preservation. And then lastly, when it comes to separation notices, um, I'm going to get into this a little bit more, you know, having a questionnaire to collect information before that person walks out the door um, because uh, you're going to lose a lot of information or you might be losing records when that person leaves your office. Next slide. <clears throat> So this is just basically our landing page to our internal website for managing the lit holds. And this is basically, we wanted to create a central spot for everyone in the office to go to, to be able to see everything in regards to litigation holds. You know, there's a list here of every lit hold in our office that's ongoing, except that we have hidden HR lit holds. So, you know, there's some complexities we have to build into the SharePoint site. And one of the things is, you know, you may be having to do litigation holds in regarding employment situations. Um, so you don't really want to advertise that to your entire office. <clears throat> There's a tracking list of all the custodians assigned to those lit holds. So you know who exactly is on lit hold. 
and uh, that, that inventory of what records are actually being preserved is listed on here as well. Next slide. So uh, this is just some screenshots of our request form. Um, so there's all sorts of information that we're trying to collect on this, but the form helps standardize information needed and collected when preparing to submit a litigation poll. And trying to complete the questions um, you know, really helps in that duty to preserve or, or answers those questions to the duty to preserve up front, as well as determine the scope of our litigation poll. Um, and I'm, I'm asking the office, you know, before they complete these forms, they're trying to identify all the record custodians, both current employees or former employees up front, identifying those systems that might be impacted by the litigation, any specific matters or cases or record series that might be impacted. So we're trying to fill in that information on here. And then when it comes to identifying former employees of our office, we try to assign a a supervisor or responsible current employee to oversee those records that might be still sitting around. So let's say John Doe separated from our office. Well, Jane Doe is still employed. She is going to be in charge of keeping track that, okay, John Doe had stuff in regards to this case. I want to know where it is and, and make sure it's not being messed with or deleted or modified, you know, you know, we need to remember that just because someone is no longer with our office doesn't mean that they did not have records or information that will help us in this litigation situation. Next slide. Um, this is just an example of, you know, the acknowledgements and reminder emails. So basically, once we plug it in, there's an FYI that will go out to those on the lit hold. And then we try to collect an acknowledgement. So, you know, if we have 10 people on a litigation hold, we're getting their acknowledgments that they understand and they have read this memo that they are now on lit hold. And the idea of this again is kind of documenting our process, providing that audit trail, backing ourselves up that we know is like, hey, we reached out to all of our employees. We let them know that there's a lit hold, that they're a part of it. They need to avoid any sort of record destruction that is relevant to this case. And with this, uh, you know, in SharePoint, you can build workflows. So you're going to get reminders about the lit hold that you're on. Or, you know, when we do release a lit hold, we can automatically send out a messaging to all these employees that, hey, the lit hold's been released. You can go about normal records retention uh, procedures as usual. Next slide. Um, this is just an example of our tracking of the actual spreadsheet or, you know, list showing all the lit holds. So, you know, this obviously will expand, it will decrease over time, just depends on how lit holds are acting. And, you know, keep in mind, some litigation may go on for years. So some of these lit holds may be open for years. So just keep that in mind. Next slide. And like I said, you know, this is kind of tailing more into that preservation step of the EDRM model. But um, when it comes to preservation, this is where I'm working to identify what actual records or accounts or devices are on the lit hold. So, you know, it could be even a cell phone that we need to grab or, or make sure is not being uh, automatically deleted over time. And identifying that stuff and building basically an inventory of those things that are on the lit hold. I can even send IT work orders through this form to, you know, say, hey, we got to lock down an Outlook account so it doesn't get erased every 30 days or something like that. So we have these controls in place. Um, I have controls in our document management system to identify matters or records that need to be on the lit hold. So, you know, this is where I kind of help myself keep track of what we need to be preserving throughout the litigation hold. Next slide. And as you may know, you know, employee separations are rough events for organizations. So for defensibility purposes and to avoid claims of spoilation or that might lead to sanctions, you know, we want record custodians who are separating from our office to fill out a questionnaire to identify where the relevant records may be or whether or not we need to take steps to work with them before they leave the office and move those records to more appropriate places, you know, so let's say, you know, over time, they may say, well, I got a bunch of text messages on my phone that regard this case, we need to get them off my phone before I leave the office. And that way you can preserve them somehow. 
So primarily this questionnaire is hoping to identify any records that might be kept or, or pulled from personal accounts or devices. And we wanna make sure those records are moved into appropriate places. So, you know, on the attorney general's network so we can make sure they're being preserved appropriately for the case. Additionally, if they're unable to move this stuff, we can then turn around and work with their supervisors to you know, get that information and, and figure out the best path forward. Next slide. And then lastly, you know, once we do get confirmation from that managing attorney that we can release a litigation hold, this is when we can send out that automated notice that basically says it can be released and we can move forth with normal record retention destruction activities. All right, thanks, Nate. That looks like a really cool process. Um, as we've gone through this, hopefully you're starting to see now why at the Attorney General's office in Ohio, records management is so intricately involved in um, the litigation hold process. Um, you know, Nate, Nate said he developed the site and you can see from everything on those check boxes and everything, why the records manager has the knowledge uh, to really play such a large role in um, e-discovery and the litigation hold process. So there are certain benefits um, to records management in the e-discovery process. It makes faster, more reliable e-discovery searches for potentially relevant information. Um, and this is due to regular disposition. If we are implementing disposition, there's less that we have to search through. There's less that we have to manage. If we have better file organizations, it takes less time uh, because we can target our search to a specific area when we're looking for relevant information. Records management helps decrease the review and the production costs because of all these things. And we reduce the overall volume of ESI that's being retained. And that means reduced storage costs. Um, and, you know, again, I want to point out that, you know, most, if not all of us on this webinar are government archivists or records managers. And so we need to be cognizant that if we have too much under litigation hold, we also have all of that information that continues to be available for uh, public records requests or FOIA requests. So in conclusion, um, when it comes to e-discovery and litigation holds, uh, the attorneys need to engage legal and they need to engage, or you know, records management, they need to engage IT. And we need to be a working group of these three groups among others. We need to have policies and procedures for records management and e-discovery, um, including, um, procedures for refining discovery requests and demonstrating reasonableness in the scope of the request, cost-effective compliance, and uh, in doing so, hopefully we can avoid sanctions. But only if we can prove that we've made a good faith effort to comply with those policies and procedures on a regular basis. That's how we're going to be able to avoid those sanctions, is to be able to demonstrate that we've made a good faith effort. Every time I give a records management training. When I talk about um, our goal, I talk about our goal as being to implement repeatable documented processes for records management, for the retention and disposition of records, because those words are so important. And they did appear in this slide presentation too. Repeatable, documented. Document it, have it written down and be able to demonstrate that each time we go through a destruction process, we do it the same way, that each time we implement a litigation hold, we do it the same time. And in doing so, you're making yourself and your records program a vital and indispensable part of your organization's processes. And with that, um, I'm going to uh, put out a call for questions. And I see that uh, John has put in the chat um, that just in case, is one of the biggest problems in records management, and it absolutely is, and it is about the least defensible uh, process or, or, or reason to retain something. And we always talk about that business value when we're determining reten retention periods. You know, we're finding that business value between, or that line between having it as long as we need to for our jobs and over-preservation. 
you know, getting hopefully eliminating that just in case. I think uh, one thing to also think about with this, Perry, is um, besides, you know, you know, your retention schedules are setting the tone, they're setting the policy of how this information should be managed. Another avenue that might really look into is start giving some numbers to it. How much is this actually costing you to store this stuff? Because it becomes very expensive over time. You know, over the past two years, I've been really learning about how much it costs for us to store a thousand ter or a thousand gigabytes or a thousand terabytes, and it does become very costly. So if you have outliers or departments that don't want to budge, start working with IT and figuring out how much is this? How much is this actually going to impact storage wise? And then, you know, you can really then start looking into, well, how much is this going to actually cost us if we did get slapped with a, a discovery request and, or subpoena or something? We need to start reviewing this stuff. Then, you know, those numbers are going to add up and that bill is going to be huge. So that those are maybe some steps to kind of think about how to avoid just in case, because that business value is going to go out the window if it's I, I might need to look at it and it's like, well, this is going to cost us $10,000 to review what you have here. So no, <laughs> you know. Any other, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say that's a really good point. I was going to ask if there were any other questions. Um, if you either want to put them in the chat or um, if you have the ability to unmute yourself, uh, we're happy to hear from you too. Okay, any questions that come in via chat, I will read for the benefit of the recording. And while we're waiting for those questions to come in, um, I have actually a comment and a question. Uh, if anybody on this call is heaving a big sigh of relief because they're thinking, oh, I'm an archivist, and thank goodness I don't have to deal with this. Um, as someone who has been deposed in a case centering upon archival records in my repository's holdings, I can assure you that the questions that uh, I was asked to answer all centered on, you know, a lot of the things that appear on slide 24, questions about, you know, how do you, how do you process records, how do you store them, how do you safeguard against inadvertent deletion or alteration, um, you know, how did you search for the information that we were seeking? Who did you talk to? When did you talk to them? Um, how you documented all of your work, so on and so forth. So uh, don't think you're off the hook. Um, and my, my question is, you know, if you're a records manager and you have not had the delight of going through uh, the process of, of dealing with e-discovery, but you suspect that it's on the horizon, um, what's the, the best way, you know, other than, of course, you know, developing a solid records management program, how do you start those conversations with IT and legal saying, you know, I see this on the horizon and we need to get out in front of this before the subpoenas start flying? That's a good question, because really we should be doing this, with, you know, that the first half of the presentation was all about getting stuff in place before litigation ever happens. Um, but it's not necessarily top of mind. It's not necessarily what people want to spend time doing. Um, you know, I know when I was at the attorney general's office, we we developed um, some mock depositions of, of different staff. And that was very eye-opening when they couldn't necessarily answer the questions. And that was almost a motivating factor. Um, you know, I, I couldn't convince them the normal records management routes, but being asked some of those questions and not necessarily being able to answer them was very, very eye-opening. Another thing to also consider, you know, boosting up that records management function in your office, you know, it's also good retention, you know, it's going to lower how many FOIA requests, public records requests you're going to deal with. So, you know, it's kind of killing two birds with one stone if you're following this procedure. So, you know, I know since Perry's left, you know, I worked more now with our chief counsel to really boost up this defensibility because, you know, like, like I said in the training, you know, your best offense is a good defense. And, you know, to avoid any sort of situations like this, uh, you know, and, and certain offices are definitely more publicly oriented so there's a bigger risk to be sued i'm sure in other agencies you know it's just making sure you have that defensible ground to work from um and yeah i'll, I'll concur with that uh 
de deposition of training. Um, I know we've done them in the past, Perry and I, where, yeah, it, it shows that when you're in a room and you can't even, well, you know, how, how did these individuals store and maintain their records? Well, I know we have our shared drive, so people keep it there. Okay, so where does Bill keep his? I don't know, you know, or something like that. That's when it's gonna, you know, come back and hurt yourself when you can't explain those things. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Perry and Nate, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, it's a lot to think about here. <laughs> and I'm glad that you're providing your contact information. I assume that if folks have any questions, they can reach out to you. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having us. All yeah. right. And if we could just advance to the next slide. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today and uh, encourage you to stay in touch with COSA via the website, the Resource Center. Um, we're still on Twitter, at least for the time being. Uh, while Twitter continues to exist. Uh, check out our Facebook page. And as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a wealth of uh, videos past Siri webinars. The recording of this webinar will be joining it shortly. Um, and lots of videos relating to digital preservation and electronic records management. So I'd like to thank you all and wish you all a very happy afternoon. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.